So welcome all of you. Thanks for coming out on this happily not rainy day. It looks, it looks like the rain held off for us. Um, I have a link up there in the top uh, to these slides on Google Drive. Um, and hopefully all of you grabbed a handout also if you grab a handout. Um, that's just a printout of exactly what I'll be going through. Um, today, so I'm going to start out really briefly with an introduction just of uh, Iris overall, and then I'm going to pass it off to uh, Natsuko next to me here um, for uh, discussing um, administrative data kind of more broadly, and then we're going to step back into Iris data specifically, um, talking about the Iris uh, data set, what is it, some of the tools we use, uh, some best practices with restricted access data. Um, details about we just released our third annual data release last month so we're going to go through what is actually in um, the current data release a little bit as well um, moving into who currently is using the data set uh, and also kind of ending with um, who we are as a team and on that note I should have started by actually introducing us <laughs> my, my name is Beth Ubersader and I'm a research support specialist uh, with Iris. This is my and supervisor, Natsuko Nichols, research manager at Iris. Her, but um, she's a research manager, so she's the lead of our uh, research support team at Iris. Um, and I work directly with her on um, everything. Uh, so that's kind of the general outline of what we're going through. So just very briefly to introduce Iris overall, um, Iris stands for the Institute for Research on Innovation and Science. Um, and we are housed at the Institute um, for Social Research on campus over on, um, our unit is actually in the Perry building, but the main ISR is on Thompson Street, um, if you're familiar. And it's um, a consortium of universities organized around a data repository. So we currently have 31 uh, member universities, of which University of Michigan is one of them, naturally. Um, and those 31 universities currently represent more than 30% of uh, federal spending on uh, research and development. Our kind of overall goal um, in growing our membership is to get up to above 95%, so um, which shakes out to somewhere around 150 members, give or take. So we have a lot of the really big ones right now because we're already at 30%, but we're, we're, we're still growing. Um, the, the map here, hi, welcome. There's chicken and some handouts in the back there. Um, this is a map of where our current numbers are uh, distributed down in the bottom here, and I'll show that again later, actually. But um, just for, for a brief background of IRIS, we are uh, a pretty new institute on campus. We were founded in uh, 2015. Um, our executive director, Jason Owen Smith, is a professor of sociology here at the University of Michigan. Um, some of the other co founders of IRIS include uh, Julia Wayne, is an economics professor. She's, at, uh, she's affiliated with NYU, New York University. Um, Bruce Weinberg is one of our other co PIs. He's at uh, Ohio State. Um, and one other thing I wanted to uh, kind of start with on the general introduction of IRIS uh, is something Jason always likes to start his presentations with, which is the general, um, he, he gives this tidbit that in uh, 2016, we as a society spent $220 per person um, on um, academic research. Uh, and what do we do with that? Uh, how do we justify that spending, et cetera, et cetera. That is basically the, the mission in a nutshell behind IRIS and why we collect the data that we do is to be able to better, um, not only to understand where that money is going, but to better explain and uh, promote the public value of the research enterprise as a whole. Um, so that's the, the real mission of IRIS. And um, to do that, we collect um, administrative data for universities, which I'm going to let uh, Natsuko mm -hmm. talk about uh, administrative data overall for a little bit. Put some money. Sit down. <laughs> so before we get to details about what we collect, what we process, and what we share with the researchers, and what kind of research environment we provide for researchers to work with uh, research data, I'd like to give some background with the focus of administrative data. 
and you probably all heard of administrative data in the past. And they are collected for the purpose of registration, record keeping, and transactions. And they're mostly associated with delivery of service. And they're derived from a um, wide range of administ administrative systems that include health systems, so patient information, and student enrollment, and performance records in the field of education, and taxation, housing, to name only a few. And you already thought about, you know, just hearing that there are a lot to do with government data. And they are not originally collected for research purposes. However, there are a lot of opportunities for researchers to do with administrative data. And you probably heard about the big data for many years now. And when we think of administrative, it is somewhat difficult to characterize administrative, administrative data in a sentence or two. But I listed uh, several points uh, that shared um, um, as a uh, common commonality among the existing literatures. They talk about challenges, they talk about uh, opportunities, and they're almost always uh, um, um, agree with the size of the data. Administrative data is almost always a larger than regular conventional data that social scientists tend to deal with, uh, mostly survey and interview data. But when it comes to census data, they're somewhat a survey data. They're definitely a whole lot bigger than a small project of survey research. So they're not necessarily always a large and small and uh, distinction, but there are also a common elements about the um, uh, background, how that administrative data become available and then how the increased attention is paid to administrative data. And that one of the most important the background is that the uh, public demands, increasing demands, and the researchers' interest for more open and transparent government data. And it's not always government government data when it comes to administrative data, and then you've probably heard about social media data, business and credit uh, um, score data, and they're all dying for getting access so that they can uh, fill in the gap that primary data could never be filled in. And the, one of the um, most important factors that I always uh, talk about, what made us to do administrative data research is that advanced technology that enable us to scrape website and compile the big data like tweet data, but at the same time, the technology that enabled us to archive for long-term preservation. So if you have access to Twitter data, well, tomorrow it may be gone. And how would you like to preserve for the uh, replication purposes? So you may have heard of the Internet Archive, profit, a nonprofit organization, and also a private vendor that compiles all the Twitter data and then sells to, as a subscription to the library. And the Michigan researchers have access to a great resource called Sysmos. And uh, I'm going to talk about resources that are available to you guys, but there are certainly uh, technology and services that requires to maintain the large amount of publicly available administrative data and also the curation process so that the researchers can understand what data are compiled and how they are processed for uh, research purposes. And then, of course, there are a lot of challenges, as I talked, as I already mentioned, about the size of data. How do you store for many years? And how do you uh, store it that comes to more long term preservation? That's a lot of different uh, elements included. And how do you track metadata if you are trying to preserve long term? So, there are a lot of uh, discussions about the challenges and opportunities across the different fields. But it also depends on what kind of research field you're in and also what kind of research question you're addressing. And at the same time, it also depends on what stage of research in the data life cycle you're in. So data storage, and that's one thing towards the end of the, the life cycle. But then how do we even discover Twitter data or social media data and any public available data? We even use any um, possible uh, federal data but it's just on the website, and then one needs to scrape the data. 
And that is something that comes with the challenges for technology, for data discovery and access. But then when it comes to dealing with data analysis, it's also like, um, how do you uh, provide the data tools and analytical tools inside of some of the virtual data enclave? For example, we give uh, data access to researchers giving that all the data does not be uh, disclosed and it's within the secure data enclave. And there are many uh, data centers provide physical or virtual secure data enclave because most of the data administrative data comes with privacy and confidentiality issues. And as I mentioned, the uh, administrative data comes mostly, comes with a large N, but at the same time, it does not always include a num uh, large number of variables. So when it comes to administrative data, it's often it often comes with descriptive. So what we can find as a pattern, not necessarily uh, statistical inference. So there is always a trade off between what kind of research questions and how do you test your hypothesis dealing with administrative data. And with increased interest and in the use of administrative data. Definitely, a um, research community around administrative data continues to grow. The first one, Federal Data Strategy, it was uh, uh, um, launched a couple of years ago, and it's by a federal government. And as I've been already talking about, they who provides. So data producer and data users and data intermediary like IRIS there are a variety of stakeholders involved around the use of administrative data. And the federal government has started taking a more consistent approach and making more engagement to bring researchers and other data stewards, librarians, and archivists to bring to the one place to discuss more uh, consistent uh, federal steward data stewardship use and access. And as you heard so much about like, oh, data will va vanish tomorrow after the administration changes. And there's always a risk that federal born digital information, we don't even know how much is out there. And then at the same time, who's preserving and how long it's going to be available for the public. And at the same time, we don't know what data are um, really meaningful for research uses. And then when it comes to documentation, that is the, uh, the, the core part of the uh, administrative data transforma transformations for research. And people were talking about we need to rescue those government data with more meaningful documentations and metadata, and not just grabbing the website and the data sources to uh, make it available tomorrow in the long time uh, uh, future. And there's a few activities and initiatives, the data refugees more focused on environmental issues because the Environmental Protection Agency has been less, um, uh, I don't know, it's meaningful to Trump administration and they're so worried about the EPA owned websites kind of vanish and they started all the archivists and librarians and researchers got together and are trying to uh, preserve this data. And ICPSR around the same time started a similar initiative, and they now have a website, ICPSR Data Lumos. They only have about 100 data set, but it's a cloud-based repository for researchers or anybody who wants to deposit government data. So it's not necessarily you collect it for your own purposes, but they're owned and produced by government initially but they want to have the place that secure that data set so that one can point for a publication, for instance. And there are other um, activities, so I would definitely encourage you to look at the data refugee or data rescue when you search Google. And there is also researcher get together and a share um, research outputs, results, using administrative data, and which is based at the George Washington, and one of our IRIS researchers went to present, and they're bringing not necessarily researchers, but also local and um, state government people and nonprofit organization. They deal with 
some drug use data or uh, inmate sort of uh, disease data, and there are very interesting light of administrative data that they're discovering and using. And there is also um, one activity and facility that I'd like to point is the uh, one of the co-PI of the IRIS, Judy Elaine, that I just mentioned, who's uh, who has very um, close connections with census. And she's been working with census, but also more towards moving from federal to local and state government agency. They also have a lot of administrative data, and they do not have much resources and attention paid to. And she's working towards uh, getting the facility, which is also providing security to enclave for researchers to have access, but um, securing the long-term preservation of the public the available uh, administrative data. And there are a lot of resources and services available across campus, and we are included for IRIS data, but government data is mostly you know, when it comes to um, your mind when we think of administrative data and the data.gov. That was one of the, uh, as part of the data rescue initiative, California Digital Library trying to grasp uh, data.gov data when the administration has changed and then data.gov is still out there. So we don't know, you know, once we decide to try to mirror everything and use the space and resources, but data.gov has never gone anywhere. So that's another thing. It's just it's somewhat we have to face with uncertainty when we deal with administrative data. And census, of course, shares hundreds and thousands of publicly available data, but at the same time, they have very restricted microdata as well for uh, SSS status researchers, swan, uh, swan, special, swan special swan status, status. Mm -hmm. researchers. And uh, the another, two other links are somewhat biased towards what we do. We do focus on, our project is focused on the research uh, spending and there are also uh, very similar government uh, activities. They put the USA spending records together and we sometimes check with them and they have uh, very detailed uh, types, different types of contract grants and different types of uh, direct payments. So when we want to check our data set with, uh, in terms of like a type of a domestic assistance, we often go there. And a federal reporter is, <coughs> Also, some uh, where we you can find the uh, grant activities and all federal funding activities you can find, and of course there are a lot of databases available for researchers on campus, and there are a lot of uh, uh, librarians here in the audience. And the one of the great research guides I uh, linked is in, uh, compiled by two librarians and. They have enormous amount of subscription-based, very expensive databases, and that is something that I always want to point to researchers because we provide our data set, but at the same time, when it comes to administrative data, the beauty of and the benefits of uh, linking administrative data using a common elements, data elements, it just double, triples the value of, and, uh, value of the data. So I would encourage all of you to go to the link and then you can even explore from one link that has a number of a public available at the same time, University of Michigan specific subscription based databases. And here we are, we are also restricted access, but we provide data resources. Here we go. Um, so I'm going to spend some time going into the, into Iris data more specifically, um, as we talked about already, the, there's uh, 31 members in IRIS right now, and we're growing all the time. I think the last I heard from our leadership team, there's 40 or 50 people kind of in the process of joining, which can be a very long process from deciding you want to join to actually executing the, the, the membership agreements and, and so on and so forth. Um, and even longer after that point before we get data from them. Um, so there, there's quite a, a time lag sometimes. Sometimes so the fact that we only started in 2015 and already have 31 members is pretty exciting. 30, 31 members with data. Um, so I'm going to go over a little bit uh, what we're talking about when we say the IRC metrics data set. Um, and you know what? I just 
remembered I was going to tell you what Umetrics actually stands for because this is an actor we use all the time. The name of our data set is the IRC Metrics data set. Umetrics is an acronym that stands for Universities Measuring the Effects of Research on Innovation, Competitiveness, and Science. And that is something that I had to write down to be able to say it to you. <laughs> we usually just say Umetrics, but we use it all the time. So I wanted to uh, tell you what we're actually, it's, it's the name of our data set. Basically, um, so when we talk about the IRC metrics data set, though, there are uh, basically two different data sets that we're talking about at any given time. And I wanted to start with what we what we tend to call the production data set because most of what I'm going to talk to you about is the research data set. Um, when we uh, talk about the process of ingesting data, getting data from our member universities, uh, our production data set is kind of the the living, breathing, it's changing all the time data set because we're continually getting more members for IRS. They're continually sending us more data. Um, and so our we have a whole team at IRIS uh, that is devoted to this part here of the, the data life cycle at IRIS, which is working closely with uh, data contacts and our member universities um, to actually ingest uh, data into um, IRIS servers and the, another big part of what the data team at IRIS does is to um, link our data. We work, in, Natsuko mentioned a little bit, we work very closely with uh, the US Census um, and a lot of the microdata we can link uh, to IRIS data to feed back um, specialized cam individual uh, campus reports to our member universities. So that's one of the big benefits that uh, university join IRIS to be able to get these reports um, uh, about activities on their campus. We have um, some, we're doing more and more kind of one-off and special reports, but our kind of flagship reports um, that we started with, we have a spending report, an employee profile report, and a vendor profile report that will give our um, member universities information. Um, the employee profile report gives information along the lines of uh, what uh, employees at the university had, like career trajectories of um, students that were trained on research grants, what they did after they left the university. Um, this is linking with census data at the individual level. We have um, the spending report kind of is, um, highlights distributions of research spending. Um, so you can look at economic impact from your university on down to the local level, or regional level, look at congressional mapping, um, things like that. Uh, we also have um, the vendor, vendor profile report, which is uh, research dollars, again, kind of economic impact in the way of spending that um, has been, that's gone to, uh, to vendors, also sub-awards to other universities. So tracking research dollars through, um, uh, through various, ways and, and we feed this back in the um, two universities in these campus reports um, that are customized at the university level. I can't actually share them with you because they're private to the universities. Um, this is a, an image of an aggregate one here that I've shared here. But so um, the uh, production, production data cycle is basically ingesting um, from directly from the universities, cleaning, curation, and census linkage, and uh, giving back the universities uh, campus reports, but most of what we're talking about today is the IRIS research data, which um, where I said the production data is kind of the living, breathing, changing all the time data set. Every year we do a data release um, for our research community that's a snapshot of that production data, and we, we take it at a particular time, and then we work on, we, we do various um, curation, cleaning uh, to prepare the data set for release most one of the most notable things is that we de-identify it um, uh, before releasing it for research use. Um, we do also uh, do a lot of linkage work uh, as part of the data release, and Natsuko is going to talk some more about that later on. Um, and then we uh, release it via two systems, actually. Um, and I'll get to those in just a sec with the next slides. Um, we have a VD data release and um, some RDC data release that I will be talking more about um, in just a minute. Uh, so the, um, the research data cycle basically is 
um, after the the university um, the universities send us data, we ingest it to servers. Um, this is all the the collection is basically our our data team working very closely with universities and with their individual systems, which are all very different. I Sugo told me a funny story the other. Uh, she presented at a conference once where they were, it was generally talking about administrative data and she gave her presentation talking about Iris and at the end of the presentation at one point someone raised their hand and said, but university data is all very standardized. You must be really lucky to, to work with such <laughs> simple data sets. <laughs> and I don't know if she laughed or cried at that point, but that's <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the data collection process itself is many people's full-time jobs. Um, and then the, the data team and the research team uh, which is the two of us plus students that work for us right now, um, uh, are both very involved in varying steps of the um, data cleaning and data curation sort of steps. Um, we remove noise from the data, we clean it. As I said, we de-identify it for research use, so uh, to protect the privacy of individuals, also of our member institutions, that's part of our member um, institution agreements. And we also add value and enhance meaning um, Again, Mitsuko is going to talk a little more about some specific linkage work that we do. And another really important step of our data cycle is the documentation that we do. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention on, on this slide, in, in the realm of data cleaning and curation, uh, we have a lot of interplay between the research data set and the production data set and the teams that work on both of these because there's a lot of times when we'll find something on the research side because researchers are actively using the data that then gets folded into the production side and the um, data team will go back to universities and say, hey, we found this in our data. Is this a mistake in the way you're sending us data? Is this, are we not understanding the variables you're giving us? Can you give us more information here? There, there's a, there's, it's really truly a cycle. It, it, um, uh, and, oh, I already said this a little bit, sorry. Going backwards, uh, the data sharing, um, after, we, uh, after we do data cleaning and curation, we have two main uh, ways in which we share data um, via our release. And one of these, this, these slides are all very full of acronyms, <laughs> um, VG data release and the RDC data release. The next slides are to explain these acronyms. Um, so the VD is the Virtual Data Enclave. Um, let's go talk a little bit about uh, data sharing and ways uh, you can share administrative data, restricted access data. Um, IRIS has our own virtual data enclave that we support um, that provides uh, our researchers with this access point. So our basic setup is that our data itself is in a SQL data database that we um, protect behind various university level, ISR level, IRIS level firewalls. Um, the actual access point to the database, we have um, researchers will access via this virtual desktop infrastructure, meaning that they can be sitting on their laptop or their PC wherever uh, they have a remote desktop connection into um, a, currently we have 15 virtual inf uh, instances and we'll scale that up as we get more researchers. Um, currently we're not at a point where there's ever, there's not enough uh, virtual instances for people to log into, um, but we will get more at the point that we need more. Um, so they, they create a remote desktop connection on their own individual machine so they can log in from wherever they are to be able to access our data, which is a really nice thing about um, this type of setup. Uh, we control the access. That's um, um, a big part of my job, actually, is just the, the actually setting up the, the access points for our researchers when they, when they onboard new researchers. Um, and the, the other acronym I had on this slide here, so that was Virtual Data Enclave, RDC, or FSRDC, um, if you're not familiar, stands for Federal Statistical Research Data Centers. Um, and these are, I wanted to specifically shout out to these because we have one right here on Michigan campus, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, there are only about, I think we're up to 29 of them nationally that are active right now. Um, there's two that, yeah, there's two on this map that I think are not, one, I believe the one in Illinois is up already and the one in Utah isn't, or maybe vice versa. But uh, it's around 30 um, of these locations throughout the country. So the, um, the Census Bureau has uh, partnerships with a bunch of research institutions in the United States. 
to give access to census microdata um, through this, uh, uh, you have to have what's called what we mentioned earlier, uh, special sworn status, which is actually a huge process to get. Um, you have to go through background checks and all sorts of interviews and so forth to be able to access this data. Um, but we at IRIS do provide our data through the census system so that if you use IRIS data, you can link it and you have special sworn status, you can use our data and link it in the census system to all of the data sets that they provide access to. And there's um, this link I gave here uh, has a whole bunch of uh, examples of uh, the sort of microdata that they have uh, available in the census. And so I specifically wanted to hire, uh, highlight this, as I said, because we do have one right here in Michigan, which is uh, fantastically convenient, especially for us at IRIS. We have our data team, all of our data team members have special sworn status. They are wor they work in what they fondly call the back cave, which is, it's a, um, as opposed to the um, virtual data enclave that we provide uh, researcher access. This is a, a physical location. It's a room that you go into to access the data. You can't take notes in or out. You, there's no internet access at all. Um, the police officers aren't even able to go into this room if they don't have a, a badge to get in. So our, our data team and the members of our staff at IRIS that uh, have access there, it's, it's very convenient that they can just go across the street to the Thompson building and um, be able to do work on all these census linkages right there in this location. But it is unique. There's only 29, 30 of them around the country. So we're really lucky to have one here at Michigan. Um, and if you, uh, I don't think, I don't have the link on here, I'm sorry, but if you look up Michigan Research Data Center, uh, it will take you right to their website. Uh, Clint Carter is our local administrator um, who can tell you more information about what it takes to actually get access at the um, RDC here. Uh, so I wanted to um, take this time to uh, talk a little bit about restricted access data in general too. We, um, we've touched around various points of this, but kind of from IRIS's perspective in particular. Um, so one of the main things with restricted access data is balancing uh, privacy and confidentiality with access, with future researchers being able to access this data. So there's um, uh, various things you can do as far as actual point of access, like the, the virtual data enclave, this, the, the physical enclave, like, um, like at the RDC. Uh, we at IRIS um, have a lot of researcher requirements right up front in order to uh, um, have, access, have data access with IRIS. We ask everyone to go through an application process, which is essentially submitting a project proposal for how they intend to use the data. Um, and they have to have IRB approval for that um, project. Um, at that point, if we, uh, if we accept a, a project proposal, then they will go through the process of signing and submitting a data use agreement. And this is an institutional level. They have to get their institution to sign off on them ha having this data access also, uh, as well as a um, use policy, which is the kind of individual level agreement which goes through you should not take screenshots of data, you, you don't take data out without uh, permission, that sort of uh, level. Um, it goes into a little more detail than the, the data use agreement, which is kind of broader language. Um, uh, so if, if researchers get a proposal accepted and get the agreement signed, um, they, uh, like I've already said, they are approved access via the remote desktop connection, which has no internet access. Um, and we also, uh, importantly, we don't let researchers bring in any data. There's a lot, most research projects, they'll, they'll submit a proposal to us saying, we want to bring this data in to link to your IRIS data for our, our research project. We have to review everything that comes into the, the enclave. Um, and so part of that is they, they can't bring anything in themselves. So we have to review everything that comes in. And likewise, we have to review everything that goes out um, as, a, as a security um, measure. Uh, I've already mentioned we, we do protect individual level privacy of the, the people in the organizations and their data by removing, masking, and collapsing variables. Um, and we have a disclosure process that is closely modeled to the census pro uh, process uh, for data exports, which is that we manually review any 
uh, how research output. So when a uh, researcher has completed their analysis or is giving a presentation and wants to publish something with our data, um, they they have a process they have to go through. They have to write a memo telling us about um, the code and the underlying data, what they use to, to produce the output, and we review that really carefully before we let anything ever come out of our enclave to make sure that there's no uh, risk of uh, identifying any um, individuals or member organizations once the, um, the output is outside of the um, This page I just put in, these are uh, the two documents I mentioned, the data use agreement, the individual or the institutional level and the individual level documents. The, the link down here that I included um, is to our data access page on our website, which steps you through the whole process of what it actually uh, takes to access data at IRIS, and um, it, all these documents are linked on there too, so you can see all the, the wording and so forth in advance. Um, the one other thing I should mention on that website, it does talk about uh, there's a, a seat fee associated with research access for IRIS if you were not at a member institution. So it's a benefit of membership um, to have free research access. So anyone affiliated affiliated with University of Michigan, um, researchers here have free access. But otherwise, um, if you're at some other institution that is not an, currently an IRIS member, um, there is an annual seat fee in order to have access. Um, the, the other uh, things I wanted to mention kind of in the, the same vein of restricted access data practices, um, we are uh, data release is a standalone release, and like I mentioned, we do it we do it once a year, so um, partially for uh, versioning, so that our researchers doing doing research with the data have have one version they're working on, as opposed to the production data, which sometimes changes every day. Um, so they can always uh, um, uh, know which version they're they're citing back to when they do publish. We don't have too many publications yet because we are pretty new, uh, but I have a list later on um, that you can look up also some of the work that's already been done with IRIS. But we do, one, th one other thing we do at IRIS is um, we mint our own uh, DUIs, digital object identifiers. Uh, we actually work through the library to do that. We have our own, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Handle, the DUI handle, the, the digits there are, are unique to IRIS. Um, so we, we mint every part of our data release every year so that when researchers do publish with our data, they can cite back. Uh, because one of the main issues we're running into and we're talking more and more about is how uh, journals that require uh, reviewers to be able to reproduce results that are published um, how do you do that with restricted access data? So one of, one of the ways we're getting there is to at least be able to give them a, a, a link that always exists to get back to our website to tell them about the data and tell them how to get access to it. Um, and we've been talking about how we might have kind of specific reviewer level um, uh, accounts also uh, because of this issue. Um, so. Moving on to the data release itself, um, I mentioned, I think at the beginning we have, we just released our new, um, we do this annually, this is our third annual data release um, since IRIS has started, and um, our numbers right now, like I already said, we're up to 31 member universities in the data. Uh, that uh, represents about 400,000 uh, funded awards, which is, 84 billion in award spending payments to, and I, I'm trying to remember what the, the numbers were last year. This is almost double in some of these figures, isn't it? It was 60, 61 or 62 billion in award spending last year, for instance. So we're, we're getting more and more data all the time, which is really exciting. Um, and Nets Natsuko is going to talk a little bit more about some of the specifics in the data set, but I wanted to show the, um, the coverage by university. This is our current year. Uh, so you can see there's a couple couple of years there we have, well, where we have data for almost every university. And one, um, when new universities join, we do try and get data as far back as, as we can from them. But one of the difficulties with administrative data is often the systems in which they're housed. And, uh, and 
anecdotally, we found that a lot of universities these change every five or ten years. <laughs> so there, there's a point at which we don't we're not able to go back very much farther. So these beginning dates are probably going to be our beginning dates. But whenever new universities join, we always try and get as far back as we can. But a lot of times it's really just the current year, fiscal year, and, and going forward. Um, we, in the midst of putting together our data documentation for this current year's release, we happen to notice what it, what this same figure looked like in our very first year release, and we're really excited how much we've grown <laughs> in two years. So our this was uh, the 2017, the very first data release. We had 19 universities just for comparison, and I think we had one year. Yeah, 2014 was complete coverage for all universities, but everything else was kind of scattered. So that's been really exciting to see just how fast we've been ever to, able to accumulate. Um, and so before I pass this off to Natsuko, uh, the, um, again, the, the data set itself, um, the core, we, we talk about it in collections. Our core collection is basically the, the files that are coming directly from our member universities. These are, these are transaction level um, data files. And then everything else uh, is stuff that we build at IRIS to help uh, give meaning to those files, and that is uh, something that Atsuko spends a lot of her life on, and I'm going to have to talk about it. <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to pick it up from here, and as you see, each file, the number of records vary very widely, and we have one of the data users in the audience, so we can even ask his response to how complicated our data set can be, or once you're in that virtual enclave, it's pretty easy to figure out, so we can even ask Gabe about our actual experience of data user. So as you see, there are various, you know, in terms of number of records and and employee uh, records, uh, this is the biggest, and you see like a 23 million records, and if we compare it to a small data set that I used to deal with when I was a grad student, and it's not even comparable, and how could you even imagine working with millions and millions of record every day. So that's something that administrative records when we're dealing with and researchers have to come up with that variety and then some universities submit a certain segment and then a whole year and and then cross-sectional uh, interest in the researchers want to do time series or cross-sectional. It is sort of restrained by what kind of data set you have because you can't build as you like and that is one of the challenges you're sort of like restrained as given and then build around the research question in a way and then almost go from what linkage, what uh, other data set you want to look for and then link to what you already have. So then here's sort of like a little bit, it's too small and it's just the whole point that I want to give you the idea is that we deal with relational database and the relational tables means that each file, each table, we call it in the table in a uh, SQL database, each file has a certain common element. So what most challenges for researcher is that look for common element first. One cannot just go in a one file in a core collection. I said award data, and then here's the employee data. How is it even related? So I usually explain in a conceptual level, here's what we usually try to explain when we provide research data set. We take administrative data collected by universities in a different system, and we try to make sense by connecting dots and provide stories. But then when to do so, we have to sort of, you know, clearly connect each data set so that university can put the data set together, and then we can ready to deal with it. So here's the record that university keeps. We, they get all the monies, primary investigators from different departments, different schools, they write proposal, they grant it. And in a word, they have certain amounts of money and they have to use it based on the execution plan. But then, of course, the money is based on originally come from taxpayers' money, so you have to be transparent. And that's the university's been doing and tracking pre-award, post-award system, and then trying to merge the two. And if the money goes to university, university decides to what to do. Our PIs hire us, which is employment, and that secure jobs. 
at the same time, we need computers to work with. Well, that also needs to be purchased by research money, which is justified as part of the research proposal. But then who we go to? Well, we can't maybe go to Amazon or maybe um, a PC center on campus and purchase various you know, computers if needed. But then that vendor is somewhat uh, restricted. So we have maybe Dell, uh, HP, and the money goes to vendors. That money needs to be clearly and accurately tracked by university. And it, when, it, when it's vendor, a service, or um, product purchase, procurement office tracks every record. And then when it's money goes to employment and hiring staff and postdocs, grad students, are, uh, research assistants, they are tracked by Office of Research, the sponsor program. So one of the biggest challenges for a data contact at each member university have to struggle to put all these data from different data sources on campus and, and handled by a different unit. The same as University of Michigan. We are very um, decentralized and we ask each university, uh, each unit, but the it comes to one place and then we sort of you know, figure out and how that data is related and in which field is um, across the different table. So here's a money flow. And also, in addition to employment, university primary investigator often come with co-investigators, like co-PIs. So co-PIs, PIs, and other uh, uh, staff, research staff, are connected through research collaborations and the money is needed to hire at different universities. So in that money flow called sub-award. So University of Michigan, Jason Owen Smith at the IRS gets a big money from NSF, for example. They have a collaborators from NYU and also OSU, and it could even bring other uh, collaborators. For that case, money officially pays to other institutions, not co-PI owned, which is always official level the recipients are organizations, um, entities. So the money goes through directly the primary award, but the primary award can be used to pay collaborators through sub-awards. So this is somewhat the conceptual level to uh, get understanding of a data set, but when it comes to uh, data tables, it's somewhat complicated. But what, I, what we like to point out is that because administrative data has common elements, it has a lot of value by linking using a common element. So one example of linkage work, what we do is money flows from federal agency, for example, if it's federal funded, and then the CP university even hire collaborators and pays, and that could be sub-recipient. And sub-recipient has another world that hiring RA and then have a collaborators and co-authors publish and then they even apply for patent and then things that they produce get patented. So there are a lot of impact that universities are interested to see visually and then we do a lot of data visualization but when we tell the stories about the impact of research, impact of education, the impact of university business, we need to link data points and then build the stories. And um, it's not just the money amount, it's not just about the how many employments, how many you know people hired by grant uh, research money, but at the same time, how much productivity, how much the um, researchers produce and then transfer the knowledge to public policy even. And one of the things we do is that using federal, um, publicly available federal award data we use a unique award identifier and then trying to link so that we have more details about award when when other uh, who are the primary investigator outside of IRIS members and what kind of publication. So we link our unique award to, let's say, NIH, National Institute of Health, under um, Health Department. We have information that who is paid by NIH grant among the IRIS members. But at the same time, we want to know NIH award amount of dollars or how many publications. So NIH tracks every single publication derived of, uh, from the, each award. 
So the publication is linked to NIH award number and award number linked to our Umetrics unique award identifier. And that links to who's uh, paid by grant. So it's interesting to connect the people, not just the publication. So there are a lot of work done by School of Information or even any social scientist about the bibliographic metrics. They do connect people through a publication citation. And there is like, you know, big uh, fat node that connects. It's a very famous article fit, um, authors that connects across disciplines. But it's not just that the research grant connects people and then they build the team. So the more research money comes in, we primary investigators get to work with co-PIs, other staff, and hire research assistant, postdoc. So that would become a growth of team. And one of the researchers using our metrics, uh, Umetrics data, and also linking to public available award data, and also publication and patent, they can build the productivity level and also looking at the size of the team. And that kind of thing is possible for any researchers that comes to you, I'm, I'm looking at librarians, <laughs> you get a lot of interesting questions from students and researchers. And if anybody who comes up with that kind of questions, please point uh, those, those uh, pet, patrons to us because that would be interesting to explore even another uh, more possibility to bring other data set. And maybe Gabe is looking at me and is already working with uh, Michigan data. So linkage work, I don't want to get into too much um, details about um, how we actually use and just like a very in a touch of it. We, I already said like the public, public available data are the key because we have a restricted data access, but then we want to show that bringing public available data, bringing in Enclave even, and then one can connect and link uh, interesting data elements to broaden the stories out of the metrics data. And very typical to use in the patented publication, but myself, I've been looking at the Federal Advisory Committee member data so there are two ways for researchers to impact, to show impact of research and have an influence on policy or into the public. And they do research, they bring money and they conduct research, they publish and they talk to um, uh, public even. But then there are a certain group of expertise and expert uh, appointed as a federal advisors. And they are on the very specific policies and the national level and federal level. It's a very strong, powerful people. But then when it comes to who they're serving on those committees, we want to know, are they really paid by a certain amount of uh, that particular agency? And that is still the mystery. And if we bring public available, federally advised, federal advisory committee member history data to your metrics, which I do, we can know that which universities are most powerful in terms of influencing policy by doing research, producing knowledge, and transforming, translating that knowledge into policy by advising the national level. So those are the possibility and much, much potential when, when we try to link. And there's, of course, a lot of challenges when we try to do a data match or the record linkage. We often, in the ideal world, everybody has one ID, and if NSF award that number, is most simple, and we like NSF because of that, but seven-digit numbers often comes with white space, dash, or extra notes saying sub-award of University of Michigan, or direct, NSF has a different direct button programs that uh, assign uh, funding. but. We don't need that, so it has to do somewhat fuzzy match and data cleaning, of course, required in advance, but exact match doesn't necessarily work. And also, not necessarily uh, looking at the one data element, we want to use a combination of multiple data elements and then place some weights on it. And then we uh, sort of uh, um, set the threshold for this certain level, we call it match because we have some somewhat at certain level we have to have a human reviewing because there are certain false positive false negatives when we do record linkage 
but we do uh, use data R, Python, more increased uh, use of Python because the packages is coming in all the time. And it's a very interesting method every day we discover, but also discovering the possibility of linking to what data set is something that we want to hear from researchers and data users and even the research support side because we haven't discovered everything yet. And that leads to who's using data, yes. including Gary. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a uh, little diagram I did almost a year ago now, so I need to update it. But the, the, the word cloud is actually just pulling from uh, research proposals that, that were sent in. Um, the, the ring here shows uh, the universities that our uh, research community is drawing from. And you can see we have a, a ton from Michigan, Ohio State, and New York University, not surprisingly, because that's where our co-PI teams are located. And so their teams are pretty big. Um, but as far as the other universities uh, represented here, there aren't actually too many. That, it's something like about half of them are not IRIS members, which I've always found interesting. One of my goals for the year is to make sure that all of our members know that free research access is a benefit they have. But anyway, so the, this is just kind of a visual depiction of uh, our, our researchers who are accessing the IRIS data. Um, to date, since we uh, started the virtual data enclave and started giving access uh, via the, the data release every year, uh, we've had more than 90 researchers access it across 24 institutions. That number is over 100 and over 35, I think, if you count the people that are accessing through the census system. Um, so it's a it's a good good number of people using it. They're um, and they're coming from all sorts of different uh, backgrounds. Also, we have a lot of sociologists, a lot of uh, economists, but people from agriculture, business, computer science. Um, uh, mathematics, all sorts of different uh, um, degree backgrounds, which is really, really exciting. Um, the, I, our director just the other day was working on a grant proposal where he asked me, so what are all our researchers up to right now? <laughs> so I had this huge long list of bullet points that I sent to him. I edited a little for, for this presentation here, but some of the, the projects we have going on right now, uh, researchers using uh, data actively include analyzing gender differences um, in uh, career pathways. We have a team that's um, working, well the, the second bullet point is Natsuko's work actually, how um, exploring the way scientific knowledge is translated into society uh, by public service activities, uh, the PACA data she was um, mentioning she links. Um, we have several different groups that are investigating how different either different funding sources um, at the, the agency level, so like NIH, uh, NSF, et cetera, and or how funding um, levels and how uncertainty or how interruptions in funding uh, affect research outputs in different way, right, ways. Like if you have, if you're right at the end of the grant and you don't know if it's gonna be renewed or not, are you hiring people at that point? Are you scaling back? There are all sorts of teams looking at that sort of thing. Um, research shocks, I think, is one of the, the words they use. Um, uh, also, various uh, ways in which uh, the structure of teams, whether it's how networked they are among different universities, whether it's their ethnic diversity, uh, any sorts of different variables, how it influences their productivity, productivity measured in ways such as publications, in ways such as patenting, etc. Um, another interesting thing I uh, really jotted down for um, Jason when I was putting this list together was that those are some research uh, topics that we have going on. There's also a lot of people that are using the data really to build tools for other types of analyses. Um, like we have a group that's uh, just testing methods uh, using our data to compute on data while encrypted. Um, what is it called? Fully homomorphic. Mm -hmm. Encryption is the, the term, um, which please don't ask me questions about that. I can't explain it very well. <laughs> but um, we have uh, some teams that are working on using our data to, to build, to test models, to build um, text analysis tools because of the, the type of data set we're working with. A whole bunch of really interesting things. I'm always, I always love getting new research proposals for ideas of 
ways in which people want to use our data. Um, here's the link I mentioned way early on, I believe, uh, to our, um, the, down here is our publications page um, on uh, Irish website. We try and keep that updated. There's a, um, the main part of the page currently has a list of things that our, our PIs are working on, basically, or have published. But then there's also a, a link to a kind of a fuller bibliography, which has a whole bunch more publication. Um, two I highlighted just here with pictures are, um, this is our, uh, one of the postdocs that's on the Ohio State team just got a whole bunch of press about one of her uh, um, working papers. She was examining uh, peer cohorts going into uh, PhD programs and how the um, the number of people uh, the number that the size both the size and the number of women versus men in, in your cohort how that affect uh, how that affects graduation rates and retention in the in the program she did some really interesting work with the, the metrics data on that um, the other one I have uh, here is a research policy article that just came out. Um, there have been several iterations of this paper. I think it was originally a, um, a presentation at a conference, but it, uh, the publication is available online now on research policy. And I pointed to this one in particular because it has a great uh, kind of description of the Numetrics data set and, and linking that can be done uh, with it uh, as a unique administrative uh, data source. So that's a really, uh, that's coming from um, Ju Julia Lloyd and Bruce Weinberg, are two of our APIs and some of their collaborators. Um, and the just kind of in, uh, in wrap up here, I wanted to circle back to the mission of IRIS overall and kind of talk a little bit about the work that Super and I do specifically um, as the research support team. Uh, because the um, one of the reasons we were really excited to reach out to people here on campus through the Enriching Scholarship uh, presentation was we want to do more more outreach and figure out how people can dis can better discover our data, how how we should be presenting ourselves um, so that they know how useful the data can be and what it can be useful for. Um, because our uh, as we grow the, the data set, as we get more members of the data set, we'll be able to tell all the more stories. Um, so we, we at IRIS, our, that's our, our mission, the segment of our mission statement there that I copied up at the top, but uh, I kind of already went through all of the things I put here, which is really just um, how we work with universities and the, the kind of cycle that uh, where researchers using our data also will get back, uh, will bring back to the universities and say, hey, we need, we need to explain these variables more, or are you pulling the variables that we think you're pulling uh, to, to work out um, issues we're finding in the data? Um, and so forth. Also, just the idea of IRIS as a an infrastructure. It's a um, we're both building this data set, but also the um, the mechanism to uh, store the data to provide access to the data in ways that are, are useful for um, both our our researcher community and also our, our member universities. Um, and a big part of that is this last line of documenting our understanding of what these data, data mean, what, um, how we can better do that, and how we can use them to answer these, these research questions um, in the, the service of the, the greater public good and uh, proving that the research enterprise is important. That's why we're all here. <laughs> um, and the, just the final here, uh, these are some of our, um, our services as a, we're called the research support team at IRIS. Um, besides uh, orienting new researchers to the data set, to the enclave also, a lot of researchers come to us not having ever worked in that sort of environment before. Um, we do all sorts of uh, basic through complicated tech support. <laughs> um, we have, uh, I think I already mentioned data import and export in the context of we control what goes in and out of the enclave. So we, we have to review everything. We have to work with researchers on, hey, no, I'm sorry, you can't bring that in, or you can't export that out, and why? And, um, there's a lot of kind of data training and data education that's part of our day-to-day -day working with, with research. Um, we're trying, trying to do more and more of that and also um, more and more in the way of communications with our research community. I didn't really talk too much about 
what we have in the, the virtual enclave, but we provide all sorts of software and tools within the enclave environment. Um, and we're trying to, to build, a lot of them are just kind of like Stata, um, R, Python, the tools that researchers use every day, but we're also trying to build more along the lines of um, GitHub and things like that that people can use to, to collaborate with each other within the, the enclave. Because um, that's something we hear from our research communities a lot is how um, how can we surely we all have this part of this question with this data set how can we better uh, reach out to other researchers and one of the, the ways in which we do promote collaboration in the enclave already is that we do have a um, kind of a directory system where the teams can have each because each enclave account is an individual account and it has to be my by necessity for security reasons. Um, you're not supposed to share your password, you, you have your own individual account. We do have uh, folder structures set up within the enclave so that people that have collaborators um, or teams that are working on similar projects can share their code with each other really easily. We also have just a general public uh, folder where we, where we will share code snippets like how to connect to the SQL database using Python and things like that. Um, we provide a lot of that right there in the Enclave as well as our, our ongoing documentation. We have a wiki in the Enclave also, um, which is interesting because there's no internet access. So it's really, <laughs> you have to post who, who wrote any particular thing because there's no way to connect to your account. <laughs> but anyway, it's, so that's another way we kind of are working to build, um, uh, build community in, in the, um, Enclave. And my last bullet point there, just uh, something we're always working to do more of is also uh, share discoveries in general and promoting the publications as they're starting to come out more and more now of our researchers that are um, using the IRIS data. And um, oh, this was a late ad. I can't forget this slide. <laughs> um, if uh, any of you are interested in attending, this is an event that is upcoming. We, we, do, we host an annual event every year, and um, the last couple of years it's been here in Ann Arbor, and this year it is again. Um, and I'm really excited about it this year because this event used to be called the IRIS Data Summit specifically, and it was very focused on our data contacts. So our um, member university uh, folks that work with us very closely in actually getting the data to us um, kind of a specific subset of our stakeholders. And um, this year, uh, we've, we've dropped the data summit. We're only calling it IRIS Summit because we're changing it this year. Um, and it has, we're gonna have three tracks. We're, we're maintaining the kind of data focused in the weeds, what does this variable mean sort of conversation track. But we're also adding a, a researcher track um, to bring in a lot of our researchers to pre uh, present the uh, um, research they're actively doing with the metrics data set. Um, and we also have a policy and outreach track that I'm also incredibly excited about. So I don't know how I'm going to be in two places at once. But um, uh, there, there are a couple of sessions where we have the, the whole, we're in the process of planning this right now. There's a couple of sessions where we'll all be together in one line, but otherwise it's going to be three separate tracks with different conversations that are kind of focused in those three areas. Um, so that should be really exciting. It's a free event. If you go to that website, that's uh, um, we ask you to please register because we do uh, we plan meals um, that are provided, um, and we just like to know who's coming. Um, but uh, it is it is free, and we'd love to, to see some of you there if, um, if you have interest. Uh, and then the last slide, we just have our our contact information there. This is a um, we use a help ticket system for. Our, our researchers primarily, but anyone can contact us there. It's just a way that we both will see a message if it goes to that, that email, so it's nice to have. Um, also our personal emails are there. Um, 